Hello, and welcome to Let Me Bore You to Sleep. My name is Jason Newland, and this is a podcast. A, <laughs> I just get, I do these introductions every time, and trying to think of new ways to say exactly the same thing. It's a sleep podcast, basically. The idea is that I just waffle on and talk rubbish for about an hour. And you just get bored and fall asleep. That's one description. There's probably nicer descriptions uh, than that. Um, it's also something that people, well, you know, if they, if you wanted just something a bit silly to listen to, or maybe you know a bit of company, you know, just hearing my voice or hearing a friendly voice. Quite, you know, my voice is fairly friendly. I don't. Yeah, I just sound like I'm about to scare you in a shower or something, you know. It's pretty... Uh, I'm not a psycho, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm an, I'm an okay person, kind of. I only listen to this... I was going to say, when you can safely close your eyes, well, I feel I might have scared people now. I only listen when you can safely close your eyes because um, falling asleep is not a good thing to do if you're, you know, piloting a submarine or something like that, or if you're controlling a one of those little trucks that are on Mars. You know, you could not remote control in it and the thing costs like half a billion dollars to send to Mars and and you end up crashing it into a a Martian or something because you fall asleep. Oh, I actually asked my friend about the tube trains. Apparently then this is for those that have listened the other night. I was talking about tube train drivers having a stick to hold on to. And I, I thought it was called an idiot stick. But it's not. It wasn't. It was called something else. I think, I th thing is, that would make it more, more of a useful uh, paragraph or sentence. If I had some more information to give to you, but I can't remember what it's called. I thought Idiot Stick's quite a good name. You know, if you fall asleep while you're driving a train. I know there's narcolepsy and stuff like that, but technically, you know, I would have thought driving a train would be quite stimulating in a sense of you know, every time you stop at a platform, you have to be looking out the window and make sure that, you know, it's safe to close the doors and everything. And each stop is, there's only maybe a couple of minutes, sometimes a lot less between stops. Unless you're on the Northern Line. And with my recollection of the Northern Line, you could be on, yeah, it takes about, six days between stops. So what I've done, what I've done, what I did, what I have, I'm not sure if I mentioned, I purchased some soundproofing foam to put on the walls. And that was last week sometime. 
on Wednesday probably to be fair yeah, last Wednesday and they've arrived today and I put them on the wall now that was a boring sentence isn't it it's like I went to the shop and I bought some bread and I came home and I ate some bread see these phone things there how many did I get one two what's eight one two three four I think there was twenty four all together so if I'm correct I got two packs of 12 unless it was 24 was in a pack I can't remember I'm really not sure but anyway I got them they came today and I thought you know what I'm going to do I'm going to put them up so this morning, but it was, I don't know what time it was. I need to get a clock and stick it to the, to my front door so I can see what time I'm being disturbed. So these, yeah, I think it was this morning or early afternoon or something like that. And they came in a package, just like a plastic package. So I'm definitely not going to buy any sex toys from that company. You know, it's like see-through and everything. You could like, oh my God, what's, what's this man up to? And I didn't have any glue or any adhesive to stick the tiles or you know the foam thingies to the wall so I thought I know what I'll do I'll go and buy some because I find that in a situation where I need something usually you know going and buying it is the kind of the right process so that's what I did and I think I was going to buy some from Amazon but they were charging nearly as much for the delivery as for the actual product itself and I ended up getting big two tubes big two, two big tubes I say big two tubes, I must have kind of known what I was meaning to say before I said it. My brain is working so quickly that the words came out muddled. I need to get a new chair, one that's not squeaky. And I went into, there's a shop called Wilkinson's. And they kind of sell, it's a lot of like cheap stuff, but it's also okay, you know, it's, it's not just like a cheap shop, uh, there's bargains, but there's also some okay stuff in there as well, it's, it's kind of like Harrods for the unemployed, and so I went in there, and I've never ever bought adhesive or glue or any kind of sticky substance from that particular retail premises but I had in my mind an idea roughly where the, the, the adhesive would be spatially within the shop itself 
And I was right. It's not a case of, all right, I bet it's inside the shop. No, that, because that would be a bit obvious. But I did, you know, I thought, I know I'm going. Because before that, I went into Iceland and uh, I was having a meeting at four. So I went to have a, I went to Iceland first. But the bus, oh, I got the bus and so I had a bath, had my breakfast first, then I had a bath, and then I thought, oh, I better, better walk quickly. Not too quickly, but not enough to get all sweaty. I kind of, I walk fast enough to get where I want to get to quicker, and maybe raise my heart pulse a little bit but not fast enough to leave me with sweaty balls you know that's kind of the the two the, the, the line the line sitting on a bus with you know sweaty bits isn't it's you know it's okay if I'm coming back from the gym but oh, it's even okay coming back home from anywhere it's a bit I think having sweaty balls is it's a bit like if you've been in a rain coming home with wet clothes although you know maybe not ideal but it's, it's still a lot better than going to work and getting there with wet clothes I'm not talking about wetting yourself I'm talking about the um, you know, the rain Although I used to get to work, I remember years ago, when I was younger, I decided, I was working in this insurance company, and I, and I, I lived quite a long way away, that was a weird noise I made there, wasn't it? I lived quite a long way away from where I worked. Not initially, when I first started working there, I lived around the corner, and I could go home at break time, at lunch time. Not break, I mean, break time was 15 minutes. It's, I could have gone home, but it would have been a case of walking up the stairs. And I don't know. Just walking back, you know, that, that's about it. Maybe 30 seconds of juggling. And then coming back, you know, there was not enough time to do much in 15 minutes. But at lunchtime, I used to get an hour. And I'd, do, I'd get back in six, seven minutes. And I'd just like go lay down. and It was great. What I always found though is the closer I live to where I worked, the more often I was late. Which is very strange, you know. I used to, I had this job once when I was younger, I was 18, and this job was in a pub and it was a weird, weird job it was. And I gave up a job that I shouldn't have done really. It's I think I think what it was at that age I think I just wanted to try new things. You know, I wanted to experiment, I wanted to instead of travelling the world I thought, oh, I'll get a job in a pub. And if I'm honest, I think at the time, I probably thought that it might be a good way to meet people and maybe uh, get a girlfriend or just make new friends, you know, learn some social skills. Didn't work out that way, although I did make one good friend um, at the time. And... 
and he yeah I think he was pretty much as weird as I was so that's probably why we got on and also I ended up living in the house of some of the customers not I don't mean like lots I think they didn't share me round I didn't oh have you got Jason this weekend no no I got him Wednesday uh, well can I have him on Monday and no, I wasn't like that they used to sit on the left hand side of the bar and they were builders and I said the reason I mean I live with is um, two of them lived in the house one of them was the landlord who owned the house and two of the other people that used to come to the bar and they were builders I think they worked for him or with him they also lived in that house and not long after I stopped working at the bar at the pub I ended up moving in there and I ended up right at the top of the house and I didn't have a television which was the first time and so, yeah probably the first time that I did, didn't watch television like regularly but at that time things were going quite well for me in a sense of oh, Andre Andre sorry about that anyone listening sometimes Andre makes these weird noises and um, luckily you can't see that I've already put him in his cage and he's not anywhere near here but thankfully you can't see that so I can pretend it was him and this this was the summer of 1989 yeah summer of 1989 so I was 18 and I was 19 in August so this was kind of April May time and I finished the job in the pub New Year's Eve and then yeah that was a weird one they so I, I know this tills would have been short because of me but only because well, I don't know about short but they because I was giving the wrong change out probably and stuff like that but they, they decided that someone was like taking money and they someone pointed a finger at me and it's not really my thing. I don't mean a finger, but you know, being accused of such things. And after New Year's Eve, which is pretty much the busiest night in any pub or nightclub, you know, it's it's just the busiest pretty much the busiest night. Um and the manager said to me, you got to come in tomorrow for extra training. And I said, I can't come in. I'm at my nan's for lunch. Because I worked all through Christmas. I didn't have Christmas dinner, Boxing Day. I worked all through that. And I said, I've got, this is going to be kind of like my Christmas. Tomorrow, you know, New Year's Day. Bearing in mind this was probably two o'clock in the morning. By the time he cleaned up, and I said, "No, I'm at my nan's for dinner." They said, "If you don't go, if you don't come in, then you haven't don't come back. You haven't got a job." So I didn't go back, and they took that as a sign of guilt that I'd robbed them or something. Yes, yeah, so what? Mind you, I got my nan quite a good present with all that money that I stole, so that was good. I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. So it's, uh, I, it's like, I said, look, I'm 19, you know, 18 years old, nearly 19. If I was stealing money, 
why would I still be wearing this coat that I've had since I was 11? And they said, don't know how to answer that. He said, how come, and I think another one said, well, how come it still fits you then? I thought, okay, that's a different story. I've got a hormone deficiency, which I didn't. Don't know why I said it. I just, I just discovered the word hormone and I thought it was funny. So I used to try and, you know, add it into conversations whenever possible. So I went to my nan's uh, New Year's dinner. And that was one of the bad decisions I've ever made, I think. It wasn't because it was a particularly amazing dinner. But all her dinners were lovely. You know, they were all... She was a brilliant cook. Um, and to be fair, it wouldn't have made any difference if she'd served us porridge. Just being there with her was pretty good anyway. Because she was lovely. So, I think I made quite a good adult decision. Because I chose... I kind of stood my ground... I lost my job over it but I stood my ground and I put my nan first or well, put myself first I suppose because it wasn't it was you know anyway I haven't thought about that in years but I was the worst barman or bar person back then it used to be called barman and barmaid that's that were the, those was the official terms of those jobs. Headmaster, headmistress, policeman, policewoman, or PC, or, you know, that's, those were the terms that people used. But I know that we can't kind of use those terms anymore. But no one used those terms in a sexist way. That's the thing. It was just because those was the terms that people used. It was just how we were brought up and taught. This is that's that's a nurse. And that's a doctor. And nurses are, um, are women. Women are nurses. When clearly, men can be nurses. And even then, men could be nurses, but there wasn't pretty many of them. I thought about being a nurse. I like the idea of caring for people. But really, I know it might sound weird, I don't always find it easy to care uh, when someone's not. I've known what sort of way when someone's really not in a great place I find the I don't like to think of it as compassion or caring or empathy but something happens inside me and I quite like that I don't like the feeling but I like maybe the way I am so I had this conversation years ago, back in 2004, and it was with my friend Will at the time, and yeah, we were living in a Buddhist community, and we were walking to town down London Road, and... I couldn't tell you the name of my last girlfriend but I can remember that conversation I think we were talking about chess because I lived down that road at the, no, maybe, no but there, I, was, I went through this little phase when I was uh, I bought an electronic chess set like one of those computerised ones it wasn't expensive it was like 30 or 40 pounds or something or £29.42, I don't know. Um, and I decided I was going to be a, a chess master and I was going to learn every move and I was going to be the best chess player ever. 
And uh, I think my friend Will said, shouldn't you learn the rules first? Just learn how to play the game for you know. It was, I didn't realise um, how pretty amazing he is, or he was at the time. He's still, he's still around, but he's uh, he's uh, an, a Buddhist order member, so he's been ordained and everything since then. But he's a pretty amazing person, actually. But the last conversation I had with him was when we was in the Buddhist community and I was upset about something. And so I was sitting downstairs with Will. I was sitting facing him. I find that's probably the best best communication way, isn't it? If you look, not necessarily look at the person, but at least be in the same room. Unless you're on the phone. Skype wasn't about that back then. You may say, well, you live in the same room, why would you Skype? I have. I've Skyped people in the same house that I've lived in. It's, uh, I've phoned people in the same room. It's room, not womb, room. I wasn't a twin. I used to think that I was a twin. And I, my dad pointed out it was a mirror. No, I, I used to think that I was... Like there was something missing, like I'd, you know, that kind of separated at birth feeling. But as far as I know, I wasn't. Although twins do come in the family, and also ginger hair. But I know we're not really talking about ginger hair, but um, my nan's brother. Anthony, he had ginger hair. I mean, not when I met him. He was grey. He was fairly elderly. He was younger than my nan. Oh, no. Yeah, he was younger, a little bit younger. And apparently he had proper ginger hair. And because... My nan's side of the family are Irish. Both her parents were Irish, and then before then, you know. And the thing is, my nan was born in England. She was born in London, East London. She was a proper Cockney. Then she moved to North London, I think maybe after the Blitz or something, because the East, the least end of London was pretty much. Uh, a lot of it was destroyed during the war and I'm covering a lot of subjects here and then she he had a little bro yeah her brother and my nan were brought up by two Irish people both um, Irish mother Irish father and they both obviously, well, had Irish accents because they were from Ireland. And then her dad used to work on the roads. So I don't know if it was like building the roads or something like that. When you say building roads, it sounds like some kind of Lego, doesn't it? By building the road, like Fraggle Rock. Do you remember Fraggle Rock? The one thing I remember from Fraggle Rock is the 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 thing. Remember the just the one saying the trash heap has spoken. That just uh, reminds me. I used to love Fraggle Rock. The thing is, I used to like it and it wasn't really aimed at me. Because it was on when my brother was young. So I used to watch it with him. But I wanted to watch it anyway. Just like the Muppet Babies. That used to be on in the 90s. I was in my 20s. And it used to be on Saturday mornings. And I used to love it. I could even sing you the song. Muppet Babies. Do, 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 do. 
Muppet, 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 Babies. And it was really cool because every every week they'd go into this kind of dreamland. You know, it's the whole creativity of, you know, young children. And they'd just get carried away and really believe what they were doing. And it's like, I used to love it. But I know it wasn't aimed at me. It wasn't aimed, not, I mean, personally. I'm not saying that they, I thought that they'd all got together in Hollywood. They got me this cartoon, Mr. Henson. There's this bloke called Jason, and he's, uh, he really liked the Muppets. But it was a bit too sophisticated for him. A bit too adult. I suppose maybe we could water it down a little bit, make something a bit more childish so that you can understand it. You know, maybe in cartoon form. Jim Henson probably said, oh, what do you want me for then? I'm a puppeteer. He said, yeah, okay, fair enough, but we still need your permission because you've got the copyrights. Oh, I have, haven't I? Does that mean I'm going to make some money? It might do if if it's successful. Oh, that's, that's good. Anything else you want to say? Well, no. No, well, you're looking a bit bewildered. Well, it's just Mr. Henson there. Uh, I always thought that you'd sound different in real life. I said, well, would you expect me to sound like Kermit? That's a voice I put on. I said, no, I thought you'd have an American accent. I said, no, no. I do really, but... Jason's too lazy to try and put an accent on. I mean, you know he can do it, don't you? Yeah, I know, I know he can. He's very, very talented. He's got an array of different accents. It's phenomenal. Sometimes I do wonder, like, why he's wasting himself doing, doing what he does. He should be just, I don't know, doing voiceovers, doing impressions. Uh, there's, there's no, he's oh, such a master. Yeah, you would say that, wouldn't you? Why? Well, it's, it's you, isn't it? You are him. Oh, don't go through that again. What do you mean, again? Oh, we did something like that a couple of days ago. Oh. Well, it's supposed to be repetitive, though, isn't it, this thing? Yeah, I suppose so. Oh, yeah, true. It is. It's kind of a win-win situation, really, isn't it? Because... Whatever I say, if it's boring, then it's ticked the box. And there's no other insult you can really give to it. So it's a compliment, it's boring. And if it's an insult, it's boring. Then it's it's a win-win. No one's ever going to say, wow, that was exciting. That was, oh, I was on the edge of me bench listening to that. It's like, oh, the, the hairs on me toes were standing up on end, wondering what's going to happen next. No, 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 that's not going to happen. No, no. No, 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 no. Before I got the job in the pub, I uh, worked in this factory putting electric meters into boxes. And to give you an idea of that memory, I lived in this little room in a house full of women. I mean, everyone that lived there was just... um, a rental and all the other rooms in the house were rented by women and the landlady was a woman or should I say the landlord was a woman and they 
they made a bit of an effort with me to sort of get to know me a bit and to they kind of made me feel welcome and um, I kept myself to myself I tried to uh, generally and I was working long hours I did a lot of overtime but I just remember I remember this uh, a couple of things in there is we were standing around on the second floor and I think it was just before my bedroom just before when my bedroom was and I think there was me and maybe the landlady and maybe one other person maybe two and I think I, I was laughing and I smiled or something and the landlady said you should do that more often I said what she said smile she said you're always so serious you never smile I said what she said yeah because we've been watching Hail and Pace on television and again I'm not even sure if I had a television there which would be weird. Why wouldn't I have a television? I was earning enough to rent my own flat. And technically I probably was earning enough to have my own mortgage. Because I was working loads of hours. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't a bad paid job. But I um, didn't know what to do with my, my money at the time. So I just wasted it on stuff. Not sure what, I can't remember. What if I used to chuck pound coins into the sea? Probably not. So I was watching through the doorway with all the other people in the house. We were kind of standing in, kind of in the door not in inside the door because I suppose there are some doors that you could fit inside if they were hollow but that you know it's a big door isn't it the size of a tree technically you say you could say a tree is a door if it's made of wood well most trees are aren't they um, but if we were standing inside the bedroom watching Hail and Pace on television and they were a commie, comedy act and they were really really popular in England back in the 80s uh, maybe even the 90s as well I can't remember how long they kind of were about for but they were like top of the game you know they were the biggest comedy act at the time and there was there was just this there's two sketches that had me and just couldn't stop laughing. One was in a hospital, and there was a man in a hospital bed, and he was in the. He basically just had really bad breath, and that's why he was in there. And the nurses and the doctors all had gas masks on. <laughs> just, it was really silly. Uh, but it's, it was, I was very young, but I did find it hilarious at the time. Um, you had to be there. Some, you know, I'm not describing it in the best way. You know, I'm not doing any justice to them. But they were really funny, funny. And there was another one, another sketch. And um, someone was in need, basically, of an ambulance. Someone was on the floor, they collapsed or something in public. And someone was shouting out, we need a doctor. Is there, is, there any, is, there any, is there a doctor here anywhere? And there was probably like 20 people surrounding this person. And one of the comedians, he's like walks through, said, uh, can you let me through please, can you let me through, let me through. Everyone like parted out of the way so he could get to the, the patient on the floor. And he just stepped over and carried on walking. So that's something that would have fitted right in with Monty Python, I think. It was that kind of uh, 
visual absurdity kind of thing. But I found that funny. It, was sort of, it wouldn't be funny if it was real life, but um, obviously, most things, not many things are that funny if you take the humour out. But uh, obviously, that would make sense, wouldn't it? I still think the funny, one of the funniest things that ever happened to me, one of the things that I found the most funny is, and I've talked about this before was Andre was my boss not Andre the ferret my son but I named him after Andre who was my best friend when I was in my 20s and he's one of the closest friends I've ever had and uh, so I named Andre after him well he was my boss at the time and he was gone somewhere and my friend who I was working with Terry came in and he'd just gone off as well and he came back uh, so I was waiting around for him to come back and I said to Terry have you seen Andre and Terry said to me oh yeah I just passed him in the toilet I was practically rolling around on the floor at one point I thought Terry was going to punch me because he seemed to be getting really annoyed with me but I found it hilarious. Just I got this visual of him pooing out Andre, and just, just I passed him in the toilet. Just I couldn't stop laughing. It, it, it there really is a tickle bone. Like you know, I think within all of us, where it just gets tickled, and then not obviously on your elbow because that's the tickle bone in your elbow. That's not. That's not the thing, is it? But, you know, when something just tickles you and just like... Try try not to laugh. And it keeps coming back. And it keeps coming back. And it keeps coming back. I'm going to stop laughing. And, um... Yeah, I quite like that. When I do that with people, sometimes, sometimes I'll, uh, especially if the person's really serious. I've met someone, maybe at work, and they're really serious, and I'm thinking, oh, I had a girlfriend that was like that once, and I really liked her, but she was really friendly, but I never heard her laugh, you know, not really laugh, and then, um, I don't know if I was in bed with her. I'm not. Don't worry. I'm not going to say. First time she saw me naked, she couldn't stop laughing. Um, because I don't want to talk about that. But I was just talking to her like a normal conversation, and I don't know if we might have been in bed or um. We might have been in the middle of doing something. I can't remember. I, within the conversation, all I said was the word "fanny fart," and she could not stop laughing. It tickled her, and she could not stop. She laughed and laughed and laughed. It couldn't stop. And it's like, wow. Because I love it when that happens to me, although usually when it happens to me, it's at the wrong time. Like a wedding or a funeral or it's, you know, uh, or during a meeting, a work thing when it's supposed to be all serious. And, and I suppose a lot of it maybe is through nerves or just... Uh, there's that energy that just needs to be released but I mean I went to a funeral I can't believe I shouldn't be talking about funerals but anyway I went to a funeral a few years back and the or- <laughs> the organist who was playing the music sounded like he was drunk 
I'm not even joking. If I played you back, if I'd have recorded it and played it to you, you'd laugh. You know, you'd think, or you'd all think, how, what? You know, and the music was off key, it was all over the place. And that was difficult because, you know, you just. It's not the right time to be, you know, it's not a time of levity, is it, generally? You know, but I think the pressure of being serious is, I'm trying to think of an example of when, oh yeah, there was one, I I was queuing up in a, I was queuing up in a uh, cafe. This was actually when I was working at the factory uh, with the meters because I worked there three times, so I'm not sure if it was the first or the second time, but there was a cafe around the corner. So I used to go around and have, sometimes get a, an egg roll. And that's what I was doing. I was... Uh, the thing is, I hadn't actually had the egg roll, but I was queuing up to get an egg roll. So everything kind of happened in the wrong order. And this, I'll give you an idea, if you walk into the, yeah, because that road, let's say walk out the factory, there's quite a bit of area, but when you actually get out of the factory onto the road where the general public are like driving up and down turn left walk up to the traffic lights then turn right and that's the same road which on the left hand side where is where the uh, the video shop used to be the very first video shop in that town was and that was just when videos were kind of introduced when people started having video players in their houses and stuff and next door to that there was this antique shop but it also had military stuff in there as well and when I was 15 I got working in in the chip shop and I was getting paid £60 a week before I went on to the YTS scheme in the September so I started in April in September I went down to £27.30 a week so it was quite a big drop but before that I was getting £60 a week which was pretty amazing because I didn't have any rent to pay, didn't, you know, still kind of living at home at the time. Uh, that was kind of a bit wobbly, but, you know, it was kind of... And the first thing I bought, because I was all into, like, martial arts and stuff, the first thing I bought, I went down to this uh, military slash antique shop next to the video shop but I'm not sure if the video shop was still down there though because I don't recall whether or not that video shop moved around the corner from where I lived or it was a different people but I know I stopped using that video shop when the video shop opened around the corner because why would you travel you know for an hour and a half walk for an hour and a half there and back to get a video when you can just walk up the road around the corner and plus the amount of time I used to spend in the video shop looking at every single title reading the the backs of every single 
video cover to try and decide which video to get because decisions of course I've never found decisions particularly easy at times I think sometimes choice when there's so many choices uh, sometimes things are a little bit simpler when there's like very little choice but having lots of choice is also quite lovely really isn't it I suppose um, but next to, so but at the time that video shop might not have been there anymore because it did move or it closed down at one point I'm sure well it, yeah it must well, it's not going to be there now is it because there are no video shops anymore but it's yeah definitely I think it definitely might have closed down but the shop next door to it was still there. I just have this recollection of the, the video shop having a board up against the, the door saying that we're closed now. Yeah, I think so. And it's like little... I'm sure that the closed sign is like closed now, but it was C-L-O-S-E-D, but the O had a little face drawn in it a couple of eyes and a and a mouth the mouth might have had a like a, that might have been like the first ever emoji wow anyway the shop next door had what I wanted and I'd already decided what I was going to get with my first week's wages went in there and I picked up a samurai sword. And that's what I took home with me. And I spent, I think I spent the full 60 pound, maybe 55 pound, something like that. And I had this samurai sword in the, uh, What's it called? Scrabbard, Scadard, Stadard, Stabbard, Scabbard. You know the the case, the thing that the that the sword goes into. And I was so pleased. I always wanted a sword. I had like some practice, like wooden swords and stuff, for martial arts shops, but I never never had like a real proper sword. And I ended up selling it back, I think, or to someone. I can't remember who I sold it to. But I think once I started earning £27.30 a week, I needed to sell it so I could buy some ice cream or something. But I loved that sword. I still remember how it felt. The, the handle was... Because it was... I'm guessing it wasn't like antique in a sense of being thousands of years old, but it was quite an old sword. It wasn't new. So it might well have been from the war. Who knows, you know. There probably wasn't a huge market for swords though back then. Generally. I don't, there's probably not a huge market now apart from the like, rare ones plus you know nowadays yes, a 15 year old couldn't walk into a shop and buy a sword probably you may say yeah but some 15 year olds they look like adults you know I didn't I probably looked about 13 12 you know, I didn't didn't look. My voice had broken. But luckily, it fixed, so we're all good now. But I remember when I was thirteen or fourteen. I can't remember that kind of age period. 
So it's quite a, a slow developer, really. I still haven't finished, I don't think. I hope. And I used to come down in the morning for breakfast and my voice would be croaky and I'd be like, morning. I try and make it as deep as possible. I'd like, and they'd say, do you want, I'd be asked, do you want um, cornflakes or Rice Krispies? I'd say, Rice Krispies, please. Then I'd be asked, do you want some orange juice? And some orange juice? I'd say, yes, please. Oh, and I'd die, oh, damn. I really thought my voice had broken. I really believe every day I'd wake up praying that my I didn't want anything else out of the world out of life all I wanted was my voice to be deep not deep deep I didn't you know I didn't have any kind of Barry White aspirations I just I just wanted to have I suppose because I didn't look like a man my idea of what a man you know wasn't I was still kind of quite childish looking I didn't have I didn't feel like a man but I wanted to for if I had at least the voice so I could walk around talking like this all the time and then people would I don't know I just wanted it it's one of those things I wasn't I suppose different periods of adolescence and puberty that I went through maybe everyone goes through it but you know at first growing growing hairs in different places was a novelty it's like oh that's weird but eventually I got bored of counting the pubes and I, I thought well what's going to happen next and then there is the incident in the shower. I'm not going to talk about it, but um, I was just doing what I always did for the last six months or so. And then something happened that hadn't happened before. And uh, I thought I was going to have to call an ambulance. I really just, I thought, oh God, I'm leaking. I'm leaking, you know, and to this day it's still the best one I've ever had. So, and then I wanted to be big and muscly, big and muscly and manly, and never was. I was little and muscly, and boy I wasn't manly and I don't even remember when my voice did break it was probably about 15 I think it wasn't one of those no when I kind of went from to I think it just happened kind of gradually in stages so I went from sounding like a girl to sounding like a woman to sounding like a woman that's been smoking for 40 years to sounding like a teenage boy to eventually sounding like a young man which is kind of what I've been kind of stuck with although I know I I don't think many people sound the way they look anyway but it's hard I find it hard to judge someone's age by looking at them but by hearing them on the phone because some people sound old I've spoken to people and they sound like they're not old but they sound like they're like adults like in their 40s or 50s 
and you find out they're only 17. And you may think, well, why? What am I doing talking to 17 year old boys? That's in my job I had. I'm not just randomly calling people up. Um, I get phone calls on, you know, for car insurance. And they'd phone up and I'd, I'd hear this like, you're your blood. I'm here to want to get some insurance. And I think, brilliant. It's a middle aged man. They're the best people. Well, middle aged people, men, women. It's the, they're the best group to sell in your car insurance to because they the, generally get the cheapest insurance providing you know everything else is good and then I felt oh good and I'll be all friendly which I should be anyway regardless of who they are and then they say yeah um, I'm 18 I thought oh okay and then I have to go through the quote even though it's pointless because either they were going to get turned down by the insurance or the insurance was going to be like £20,000 or something ridiculous like that because um, instead of getting a little old Ford KA or a little Mini something that's worth maybe £800 and very low engine so you know low value that doesn't go very fast or do very little they'd end up getting the closest thing to a speed car that they could get and they wondered why they couldn't get insurance or get decent insurance that was cheap unfortunately we couldn't sort of just say oh sorry can you call back when you're an adult in 20 years when you can get good insurance for you then good prices I did a quote for someone once and they had a I think they had a Mercedes and he was 18 and he had a Mercedes and I just went through the whole thing I didn't bother really chatting to him I was like this is just another wasted 20 minutes because because that's what kind of you get used to it after a while I start expecting because it's some Mercedes 18 year old when he gets such a if you do get a quote the price is going to be tremendous I was amazed we did get a quote a price came up and I said something like, okay, this is going to cost you uh, like eight eight thousand pounds for the insurance. And he said, oh, okay then. I said, what? I said, yeah. He said, uh, so you want to pay it monthly, obviously. I said, no, no, I'll pay it now. And then he, and then, <laughs> then he shouted, dad. <laughs> and his dad paid it on the credit card. So, uh, it just shows you that you can't you can't always you can't judge you can it's natural to judge but we all do it it's just human nature isn't it but I did find it very very interesting how that worked out though because like I'd already predetermined that it was going to be a waste of time but it wasn't But it's so easy to use that as an example of what well, it just shows that people, you know, it's not a waste of time quoting people of that age. And, but actually, in reality, it was in the job I had because 99.9% .9 didn't buy anything because they couldn't, because who can afford? that kind of money for car, for car insurance it's just it's ridiculous people used to get sacked for that though you know when I first got there old uh, Anne not Anne Summers what's her name Anne oh 
I can't remember her name anyway. She was she had a chat show. Like no, she had a, a game show that was really popular all around the world. This was the early two thousands, two thousand and one, and I was in training, and they played us a call of someone that we shouldn't do, and basically how we shouldn't treat the customers, and uh, this. And this is a call from a, someone that was working there that had just been sacked for what he did. So they were sort of letting us know that you cannot be rude to the customers, otherwise you get, that's it. Which is fair enough, you know. It's, it's, uh, it should be respectful to the customers. And basically what he did was... The customer was being rude to him and just being awkward with every question. Some people would do that. They'd phone up and they'd say, yeah, I'd like a quote. I cast and take take your name first. What do you want my name for? Well, we can't do the quote without your name. Well, just give me a quote. No, I need your name. Okay, your name. Your date of birth. What do you want my date of birth for? That's a date of birth. And I, it's like, and they go through every single question. And they say, is this going to take long? Why is it taking so long? Well, if you answer the questions as I ask them, it just answer the questions and it will be done quicker than if you don't answer the questions. But again, that can be sound rude, can't it? Anyway, this, this person, this man on the phone was being rude. Like, just awkward all the way through. And... Uh, the, in the end, the person didn't get a price, so that the computer the computer system refused to insure this man uh, due to I don't know maybe uh, whatever reason I don't know why. It can be a multiple. It could be convictions. It could be uh, the type of car. If it's uh, import, if it's you know, it's lots of different things. And the bloke started complaining. He said, what do you mean you won't show me? I've been on the phone for 30 minutes now and you won't show me. He said, why is it? And uh, the bloke on the phone said, sorry, sir, you are the weakest link. Goodbye. And he put the phone down on the customer. The customer phoned back and all the calls were recorded which is how they managed to play us the call otherwise I mean, they didn't get an actor to reenact it um, and even the the managers that came in sort of told us not to do that he said we were laughing when we were listening to it but we had no choice you know because it's funny but it's you can't do that You know, I mean, if you imagine if you was in a supermarket and some a customer was just being rude, really, really rude, and you you put a, you put a cake on the head, like a big chocolate cake, and just squashed it in their face or something, you're gonna get you're gonna get lose your job on you, although it's a funny thing to do. And it's a lot better than some things that could be done, but a waste of a chocolate cake, though, if you ask me. Everyone else would be going, oh, I see, I can't believe you did that. We sat, people would be laughing. It'd be me licking the f- chocolate off her face. I love chocolate. Again, that might have sounded a bit weird. It wasn't about licking. It was more about the chocolate. Mind you, oh, I had a bath today. I had my hair cut last night. So I've got a grade two. I might have mentioned that in yesterday's recording. But I think it's probably time to bring this thing to an end because I've been rabbiting on for longer than I expected to be. An hour and ten minutes. So. But I've got these thingies on the wall 
and I'm going to get these soundproof things on the wall. I'm going to get the whole wall covered in them with different colours. So it's, otherwise the room will be black because these are black black um, foam tiles. So it would be a very dark room if I had that. So I want to get some blue and red ones and uh, have the whole room soundproofed. And get some soundproof curtains. And also get a soundproof mat uh, to cover the entire floor. As many mats as I need to. So I get the whole floor. Maybe in the same material as you have in the children playground. You know where the little kids jumping around and it's all foamy. Have it so this whole room is just soundproofed. Not not just for making recordings, but also so that I don't disturb anyone else. I like the idea of being able to get up at three in the morning, or still being awake at three in the morning. It's half two now, and to be able to think, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna sing an ABBA song as loud as I can. And I'd like to be able to do that without disturbing anyone. I don't want to disturb people. So I can't do that at the moment. But I like the idea of being able to if I wanted. And also, if in the future whoever moves in downstairs, in the future if they happen to be... uh, you know, uh, loud, let's say, it's just, you know, whatever they're doing, I'd like to have it so that I can't hear them either. That'd like be a perfect situation. I'm just worried that the place might look like a big padded cell, so I need to sort of be a little bit mindful of that. And I'm probably going to, once I've got the foam on, I'm probably going to put other foam on as well, on top. I want to make it I don't want to put so much foam that I've only got. I can only move. I'm sort of stuck in the middle of the room. And I can only move three inches either way. Because that would be silly. But I want to make it so it sounds nice. And I've got no background sound. I mean, I've got the... I so said I've got these tiles, these soundproof tiles, to the right-hand side of me and to the back of me. If I had them to the left of me as well, and on top of me, then and in front of me. So yeah, I don't know. Just wait and see. I'm also going to do the ceiling as well. Because what I remember is at Graceland, I'm not comparing myself to Elvis, I'm just saying in Graceland, Elvis used to have a carpet on the ceiling. And you might say, yeah, but he was on all kinds of drugs. No, it's not about that. It's, mind you, if he was on drugs and there's a carpet on a ceiling, that would be really weird when you sort of wake up. But it was an acoustic thing because Elvis loved music. He loved singing. He wasn't doing it for the money. He loved singing. He wouldn't have done according to documentaries he wouldn't have been doing what he was doing he wouldn't have been doing all those concerts when he wasn't well but he loved singing and if it had been treated properly he might still be around singing it would be in his 80s and it'd just be just like an old like Johnny Cash you know when he was elderly Except a sexier version. Yeah, I'm a big Elvis fan. I love myself a bit of Elvis. I've only known one other Elvis though. Elvis Costello. I can't think of any other Elvises that have been famous before or afterwards. That must have been a gamble for Elvis Costello to take the name of Elvis because that's not even his real name, I don't think. It might be. 
But to, to have that name when you, the most famous singer, pretty much of all time, in the West anyway, is Elvis Presley. the most successful singer of all time no one not even Michael Jackson touched him when it came well <laughs> used different words maybe there but you know what I mean he's I loved Elvis I mean part of me would have liked to have been around in the late 50s when he was first in when he first you know 1957 when he was first big and all the way through the 60s and going to the cinema watching his movies but then I'd be in my 70s so you know I don't I'd probably rather just stick to being 48 and having kind of missed missed seeing or being around when he was young and that excitement I still yeah I still kind of there's nothing wrong with being in the 70s. I kind of look forward to it. I love the idea of being in my 70s and looking back and feeling that I've actually accomplished something. That's a feeling I'm looking forward to. You know, I've talked for way, way too much time. I'll speak to you later and remember you deserve to be happy and be kind to yourself and I'll speak to you next time and if you are still listening you can like my specific Facebook page that I've got which is Let Me Boy to Sleep and join me and uh, the other people that like these recordings bye for now